So, hello, good afternoon. My name is Ed, and uh, the, the reason I have three different job descriptions on my uh, title slide is because I'm very bad at saying no to things, uh, particularly things to do with Huntington's disease. So, to just make, to demystify, because that's why I'm here, the top one means that I'm a Huntington's disease researcher, the middle one means that I'm a neurologist, and the bottom one means that I helped, I co founded HD Buzz with my friend and colleague, Jeff Carroll. What I'm here today to do uh, is very easy. Anyone could do it, and it, it's no problem at all. Simply to explain two and a half days of hardcore science in 50 minutes. Um, so uh, I'm sure that won't be a problem. Needless to say, what I will have to do is focus on the more uh, exciting things, the things that are most likely to be of interest and uh, relevance to you guys who are either living with Huntington's or you know someone who is, or you may be professionals who are involved in the care of Huntington's disease, patients and families. So what I've decided to do is boil it down. It's been an amazing meeting. It's been absolutely great. I'm going to try and boil it down to four areas. Um, hardcore science areas. The first one is about prevalence. How common is Huntington's disease? The second is understanding the disease. Um, sometimes it may appear that we do a lot of staring down microscopes and describing Huntington's disease, when what we should really be doing is treating Huntington's disease. But of course, uh, you can't really treat Huntington's disease until you understand it. And while we do clinical trials and drug trials on, on one end of the spectrum, at the same time, it's absolutely essential that we have basic research going on into understanding what causes the disease, how cells become damaged and so on, uh, because that's how we keep our research pipeline full and always moving forward. So some, some uh, comments on that. And then stem cells I want to touch on specifically because I know that everyone wants to know about them. They were discussed at some length at this meeting. Uh, but of course, really, you know, the thing that you, I guess you want to hear most of from the meeting is how are we doing with therapies and possible treatments that we hope may slow down the progression of Huntington's disease or indeed uh, provide new treatments for the symptoms of HD to give people a better quality of life for longer. So the bulk of my talk is actually on therapies. And uh, now I come to review this slide, I realise that actually I'm doing therapies as number three and stem cells as number four. So that was really just to make sure you're concentrated. But first, I need to do my characteristic uh, plug for HD Buzz. Hands up if you have heard of HD Buzz. Excellent. You are, I mean, you know, <laughs> that's wonderful. You are clearly uh, some of the most, the best informed people in the world when it comes to Huntington's disease. Not because you've heard of HD Buzz, but because you've all made the effort to come here to this meeting. So I'm really pleased that you've heard of it. Hands up if you uh, find it useful yourselves. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And actually, I, I'm recognising in the audience several people who represent individual European associations who very kindly donated money in support of HD Buzz, and it's our great pleasure to have that partnership uh, and to be able to provide the research news. So I won't need to spend very long plugging it. In fact, what I really want to do is just draw your attention to some aspects. Oh, there's Jeff. Um, I'm not sure if he's in the gallery. No, he's around somewhere. Um, I want to draw your attention to some aspects of HD Buzz that have been relevant to this meeting because we've been really um, putting in a lot of effort to try and um, bring this meeting alive and bring it to the global HD community through HD Buzz. So, um, any uh, Twitter followers in the audience? Yes. Hey, excellent. <laughs> so, we've been tweeting uh, research updates throughout the meeting. HD Buzz Feed is our Twitter handle. Um, and we've been doing that in quite some detail. We've also been providing updates on Facebook. And then at the end of each day, we've been producing these uh, summary news stories, which are pulled from the Twitter feed. They're up online already. If you go to hdbuzz.net, the English uh, articles are up. And as soon as they're up, our army of translators begins translating them into our 12 languages. So um, basically, every single science session is covered on HD Buzz in those stories. So if there's anything I missed today, you can always go back to HD Buzz and see what we said about it during the conference. The other thing we've been doing is the, uh, is the um, Euro Buzz uh, feature, which we've been doing at the end of each day, interviewing scientists, having a bit of fun, explaining HD research, 
And those sessions are, will be available hopefully in the next week or so uh, as a video, uh, two videos, which will be up on the HD Buzz site. So, and, and we've specifically picked the scientists who are presenting the research that's most likely to be useful to, to you guys, to community members. Um, and we've uh, uh, helped the scientists to explain their research in, in terms that hopefully patients and family members will understand. So those will be up later in the week. Um, have I missed anything? No, I think that probably covers it. On the subject of translation, though, these are the 12 uh, languages, uh, European languages, that HD Buzz is now available in. Um, so uh, make a note of the country code that corresponds to your uh, um, language. If on the HD Buzz site, you have to click on this little globe icon at the top of the page to get the drop-down list of languages. Um, and this is a very uh, exclusive sneak preview of HD Buzz 2, which will be coming hopefully later in the year. It's a redesigned site. A number of things should be a lot easier to navigate, but in particular, uh, the language uh, drop-down box is a lot more prominent, so it's a lot, hopefully that will encourage a lot more participation from non-English speakers. Um, and the other thing we're doing to try and um, help people who are brand new to HD research is this start here feature. So if, you've, if, you're, if you or someone you know wants to find out about Huntington's disease research but hasn't got a clue where to start, you can send them to HD Buzz and tell them to click on the start here button. And that will um, take, talk them through Huntington's disease, tells them about us, and then we go straight into treatment research, starting with the most exciting things from the ground up, as we say. So that's all pretty cool. And the other thing is the, uh, the, the new version of HD Buzz will allow you to download PDFs. So if any of you um, have relatives or friends who are uh, interested in finding out about research but are not online or don't like using the internet or don't use Twitter or whatever, you can print off these PDFs. And they're basically individual fact sheets, each one about a research topic, all in plain language. If you run a support group, or if you're a member of a support group, you can print as many of them off as you like. It's all completely free of charge. They're in all the 12 languages that we have. Um, and if you, um, you know, the, the HD clinics that you go to, go along, take some fact sheets with you, and, and maybe tell the clinic organizers that they can get these PDFs and put them in their clinics. So the more, the more people that read our uh, stuff, the better. Okay, so before I go on to present some of the specific science that came from this meeting, um, because there were many people in the audience who uh, didn't understand a lot of what was said. Because ultimately, each scientist can only work on a small area of Huntington's disease. And they very often will get on the stage and present as if everyone understands everything they already understand. And all they're presenting is a few new things. But of course, really, we need to try and get everyone up to a certain level of understanding so that they can then appreciate what's been said during the meeting. So I want to start with some basics about how research works, how we do science, and then we can move on to what, what's new. So, I often talk about Huntington's disease research and finding effective treatments for HD as being a bit like a voyage up a mountain. And in particular, in the case of HD, it's sort of like a mountain where we, we don't even know how tall it is. So we don't know how long it will take us to get there. All we know is it's hard and it's big. Um, and we've heard the word hope already, and it's a word that is used a lot, but uh, people sometimes tell me that they're sick of hearing the word hope because they've been hearing it for so long and still we don't have treatments. But I do think that there is still room for hope in the lives of people living with HD. Um, but what I would encourage people to have, as well as this hope, hope that we will reach the top of the mountain behind that cloud, is, this, is a different, or rather special kind of hope that I refer to as substantive hope. So if you were trying to climb this mountain, you'd be a bit bonkers, by which, I'm sorry, I do have a tendency to use English, uh, strange, <laughs> old-fashioned English words. Um, you'd be a bit mad if you, <laughs> if you thought you could just set off one morning and get to the top of that mountain behind that cloud. That wouldn't be a good way of going about it. So my view is that we need to break the journey down into small steps. And that way, we keep the mountain in the back of our minds, but if at any time all we're worrying about is getting up that step and that step and that step, suddenly the journey to the top of the mountain is a lot more manageable and a lot less intimidating. 
And we're also much less likely to be disappointed if we wake up one step up instead of at the top of the mountain. So, this is what I refer to as substantive hope. But what it, what it means is that we need someone to fill in the steps, and hopefully that's what I will do, and that's what we will continue to do through HD Buzz. But I don't want you to lose this overarching sense of hope, so I'm going to give you five big reasons to have hope. Um, and I like to say Huntington's is the most curable, incurable brain disorder. Uh, some people don't like the word cure, some people don't like the word incurable. I use them both very, very cautiously. <laughs> and I see that Charles is sitting there, gently fuming. Um, here's what I mean by that. Nearly 20 years ago the gene was discovered, and Huntington's is unusual in that everyone with that mutation gets Huntington's disease. Everyone with Huntington's disease has the same basic mutation. And that immediately gives us a head start over Alzheimer's disease, and Parkinson's disease, and motor neuron disease. You know, we know exactly what we have to do to uh, treat Huntington's disease. We just have to get rid of the effects of this mutation. <coughs> and lots of treatments have already worked in animal models of Huntington's. So you can put the gene in a mouse, or a fly, or a, a moomin for any locals in the audience. Um, and. Um, you know, and you can, you can give drugs or certain treatments to those animals and they, the, the disease is less bad. So we know that it's treatable in these animal models. All we need now is a pill that turns humans into mice, and then we'll be fine. Um, but seriously, you know, we, we have come a long way, and I know it feels like we haven't because there aren't, you know, the treatments aren't there yet, but we really are making progress. Number two sounds a bit boring, and it's about the global... Uh, infrastructure. Unlike many other conditions, we have fantastic organizations like EHTN, like the EHA in America, they have a Huntington study group. The patient groups are absolutely critical and they're extremely well organized in Huntington's disease because it's a family disease and it's a community disease and because of the way that interacting with patients moves doctors and professionals. Um, it's very rare for a researcher or professional to leave the world of Huntington's disease because we want to help you guys uh, and you know we're, we're essentially in for the long haul. So we've got this phenomenal worldwide infrastructure um, in addition we have this thing called the CHDI Foundation. They don't pay my salary, I don't, I don't <coughs> take any money from them, they're a non-profit organisation rather like a drug company but they solely focus on treatments for Huntington's disease and they put an awful lot of money and organisation into that. And I really do think that that strategy, if, if anything will succeed, I think that strategy of, of behaving like a drug company, like a Pfizer or a Glaxo, but focusing just on Huntington's disease, is, is the one that will succeed. Talking of big drug companies, there are, there are big multinational, multi-billion dollar drug companies that are interested in treatments for Huntington's disease. At this meeting alone, we heard from representatives of GlaxoSmithKline and Pfizer, huge drug companies, um, and one thing that they have is the money to run the <coughs> clinical trials, which is otherwise very difficult to come by. They also have the expertise to get drugs licensed and marketed, uh, but I think really the, the fact that these big organizations are interested is a sign that they are, that the, the, the quality of Huntington's disease research is very healthy. It's like when sharks appear in, in, a, in a sea, it means that the sea is very clean. I'm not saying that they're sharks, but they're high-level predators. Okay. And crucially, the, the whole world of Huntington's disease and the, the global community is expanding. In recent years, we've seen the South American network, the Chinese network, and there's networks popping up all over the world. And they're not isolated from each other. Essentially, the world is becoming one big Huntington's disease network. And that's a, a huge driver when it comes to research and driving forward would work into treatment. Number three is something that we call the golden window of opportunity. And Sarah Tabrizi presented this slide. Essentially, you're born without signs of the disease. If you have the gene that causes Huntington's at some point, unless we can come up with treatments that will delay onset, <coughs> symptoms will develop. Before the symptoms begin though, as many as 20 or 30 years before the symptoms begin, we know that the, the brain cells, the neurons, are sort of struggling. They're not working perfectly because of early subtle effects of that mutation. Um, however, 
because we can do a genetic test, we can, just, we can predict who's going to go on and develop those symptoms. So if we can develop treatments that will um, relieve some of those pressures on brain cells, we should be able to push forward the age of symptom onset. We have that in HD. They haven't got that in Alzheimer's or Parkinson's because they have no way of knowing who's going to get the disease. That, helps us, that will help us when it comes to treating people in the future, but it, would, it also helps us now when it comes to studying the disease. Um, I think my numbers might be out if I've gone from three to five. <laughs> I'm not doing very well with numbers today. Um, uh, having symptoms doesn't mean it's too late. Uh, so that, that slide was about preventing onset. What about if you already have symptoms when we develop treatments? Well, th there's, an ex there's a technique called gene silencing, which I'm going to talk about later. Essentially, it means you can switch off the HD gene. It's not possible in humans yet, but it's been done in many mouse models. Essentially, the mouse is born with the HD gene or the mutation, and at some point it becomes unwell. If you switch off the gene after the mouse has become unwell, the mouse gets better. The symptoms get better. And if you look at the mouse brain under the microscope, the damage in the brain cells actually gets better as well. Now, Huntington's is, none of this means that Huntington's is not a neurodegenerative disease. Brain cells do die, and once they die, there's no bringing them back. But for any person, we're optimistic if we can slow down the damage in those cells that people who already have symptoms may see improvements or at least may benefit from those treatments. So having symptoms doesn't mean it's too late. And this is the last one. Uh, this is actually number five. Uh, <laughs> science is cumulative. Every, science is like this glacier or glacier, if you prefer. Snow falls at the top of it, and each snowflake doesn't make much difference. But over, over years and decades and hundreds of years, the, the, the weight builds up. And eventually what you end up with is this huge structure which can move mountains. And uh, to my mind, that's how science works. And this brings us back to these little steps of substantive hope. Each step takes us a little bit closer. Each day we know a bit more than we did the day before. And tomorrow we'll know a bit more. Okay. Very brief diversion to how drugs are developed. Because this, I think, gives an idea of why it takes such a long time. And this is what I've mentioned already, the drug development pipeline. And today, uh, yesterday rather, we heard about treatments that were all, all the way through this pipeline. Essentially what happens is that you, you have to do a lot of work in cells and in the lab and messing around with chemicals to put a drug into the pipeline. Once you have a drug or a target and a drug that match each other, then you test it. You test it in cells, you test it in worms and so on and so on. And then once it's been tested exhaustively, then you can start your human trials. And those are divided into several stages. So first you have to establish in healthy volunteers that the drug is safe, then small numbers of patients for safety, and then the big trials where you find out whether the drug actually works in patients or not. It takes at least 10 years to get a drug through this pipeline. And the bottom bit alone often takes around five years. So, uh, you know, we, we discovered the gene in 93, and that's when really we were able to, for the first time, identify possible targets in cells. But there are targets that we're just hearing about this year that are new and exciting, that where you know those drugs will have to be developed from scratch. So I think that, that for me, this message, the message number one is it does take a long time, but we are working on it. Number two, the pipeline is full. Right now, for Huntington's disease, there are drugs uh, at the very early stages, and there are drugs that are right about to go into clinical trials. And there are clinical trials going on now, make no mistake. There are drug trials happening now in Europe and in America of things that we, you know, we hope will slow down Huntington's. Okay, here comes the science part. Everybody still awake? Yeah. Excellent. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, increased prevalence. Um, so prevalence basically means how many people are there at any one time in a particular population who have Huntington's disease. Um, and Michael Hayden spoke about this on the first day of the meeting. We, when we talk about prevalence, we, we, we talk about numbers per 100,000 or per 10,000. What this means is that if you had, had 100,000 people in a population, four to six of them would have signs of Huntington's disease. And this is the traditional textbook figure, and it comes from studies that, that were conducted before or around the time the gene was, uh, was first discovered. Now, a lot has happened since then. Um, we've become a lot more aware of um, how to diagnose Huntington's disease um, clinically. In other words, 
if, uh, if Huntington's is well known in a family, um, it, 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 it's fairly easy to pick up because someone says, oh, my mother had Huntington's disease and I want to have the test. But new cases where the family history is not known or where it's emerging for the first time, it's previously often taken two or three generations for those diagnoses to become apparent. But now I think we're getting a bit better at picking them up. And people are living longer as well, which, is in it, which enables the signs of later onset Huntington's disease to emerge. And I think a lot of what's happening as well is that people are simply um, gradually lifting the stigma of the disease so that people are more prepared to talk about it with their families and with their carers and doctors, um, so that uh, essentially we're just a lot more aware of the cases out there. So the HD Association in the UK um, spoke to Sir Michael Rawlins, who's the chairman of uh, NICE, which is a health body in the UK, and said, we're told that there's four to six per 100,000. We actually have twice as many people as that already uh, on our books that we're caring for. So there's no way that figure can be correct. So Michael Rawlins has now done a study where he's looked at the nationwide um, general practice database and has produced this figure of at least 12 per 100,000 um, for Huntington's disease in the UK. Michael Hayden's group in Canada did a similar study and have produced a figure of up to 15. So it's looking like Huntington's is at least twice as common in the population as we thought. Now this probably doesn't come as a surprise to you guys because whenever I, because this news basically came from the community um, and from families saying there's no way that Huntington's is as rare as that. And so really this is basically science vindicating what the community has told us. What, what it means is that governments and health organisations need to dedicate more resources to caring for Huntington's families and patients. Um, and uh, it also means that in the future as the population ages, we may end up with even more uh, cases of Huntington's disease. So that's something to be aware of. Um, but moving on to the, the um, lab science, as it were, talking about pathology and treatments, just a little perspective, because I'm going to be talking about cells and genes and all that sort of stuff. This is uh, our, uh, an artist's impression of our galaxy, the Milky Way, and it contains 100,000 million stars. If you multiply that number by 100, you get a number of cells in the human body. So it's quite a lot. And each and every one of those cells contains our genome, all of our genes, including two copies of the Huntington gene. The uh, cell has a nucleus, where the DNA is, and a cytoplasm, where all of the other stuff happens. And cells are basically powered and all, their, all of the business of the cell is done by these machines called proteins. And in the, in the nucleus is our DNA, our genes made of DNA. One gene is a recipe for one protein. And on the way to making the protein, this message molecule called RNA is manufactured. And then it, it's used to make a string of these little blobs called amino acids, and those then assemble into a protein. And in the case of Huntington's disease, the Huntington gene leads to Huntington RNA, and that then leads to the Huntington protein. And as you know, Huntington genetics is all about the CAG. We have this repeat of CAG, these letters in our G. And each CAG corresponds to one little building block called glutamine, which scientists call the letter Q. <coughs> Excuse me. What that does is, it takes this normal Huntington protein, which looks something like that. The CAG bit is here, uh, or rather the, the, all of those little cues, the glutamines are there. Having too many glutamines in a row changes the shape of that, but it also changes the shape of the whole protein. So the whole protein changes in shape as a result of that small lengthening of this glutamine bit. And if you're a protein, then changing your shape will change your function, because the functioning of proteins depends on their shape. Which leads to public enemy number one, which is this, the mutant Huntington protein. This is a, a microscope uh, a picture of the Huntington protein. And as you can see, it forms into these mountain-like blobs called aggregates. But we think the, the poisonous bit is actually this, this bit here before it forms into the aggregates. So 
This is the cause of all of the problems in Huntington's disease, the mutant Huntington protein. And it does loads <coughs> of stuff. It basically messes up loads of things that need to happen for our cells to be happy. And our neurons, unfortunately, suffer as a result. So now we have the, that's my Huntington's disease basics 101. What have we learned during this meeting about how that protein causes harm? Well, for me, there were two uh, striking talks. This is Jill Bates from London, and she studies uh, a protein called HDAC4. Now, HDACs are a family of um, enzymes which control which genes are switched on and off. And um, HDAC4 has long been uh, of interest when it comes to a possible treatment for Huntington's disease because the Huntington protein messes up the switching on and off of other genes. But Jill has been uh, studying all of these HDAC enzymes with a particular emphasis on HDAC4, and what she's uncovered is that it seems that the effects of HDAC that protect, uh, or that are to do with Huntington's disease, are actually happening not in the nucleus where the DNA is, but in the cytoplasm where there isn't any DNA. So this is a, this is a sort of major upheaval in our understanding of this um, important protein. And Jill's lab is now looking into why that might happen. And the other talk that really uh, fascinated me on the basic science of Huntington's was by Ray Truant, um, who, who has been looking at the structure of the protein and how it moves around in cells. And he describes the protein as being a bit like a slinky, you know, like a spring. It has lots of these stretchy bits, and it changes shape, and it may have something to do with sending signals around the cell based on what shape it has. Um, and in particular, Huntington's disease has something to do with the way our cells handle stress. Um, and the polyglutamine, that all of those extra glutamines in the mutant Huntington protein, so in, some, in some ways seem to be making the Huntington protein less able to help the cell deal with stress. Something about that glutamine stretch makes the, cell, makes the Huntington protein less springy. And Ray calls it his rusty hinge hypothesis, which is quite useful. We actually interviewed Ray Truitt on stage. So once the Eurobuzz videos are online at HD Buzz, you can hear Ray talking directly about his science in, in terms that are pretty easy to understand, I think. Moving on then to therapies. How long have I got left? Some minutes, excellent. I'll keep going until there aren't some minutes. So, gene silencing therapy. Hands up if you've heard of it. I did mention it earlier, so you should all have your hand up. But that wasn't what I, what I was asking. This is one of the most sort of famous possible approaches. Basically, if, if your house is flooding, it's important to mop up the water, but what's most important is turning off the tap or faucet, if you're an American English speaker. Um, what gene silencing or Huntington lowering therapy basically involves is admitting that it's very difficult to change the DNA in all of our cells, but saying, well, maybe if the Huntington RNA gets made, but we can stop that from getting turned into a protein, then there won't be as much of the mutant protein hanging around. And it turns out that our cells actually have mechanisms already for getting rid of unwanted RNA. So all that's needed really is to design drugs that stick to the Huntington RNA and say to the cell, excuse me, get rid of this. What I'm attached to, get rid of it. And um, it works, essentially. It's been tested now in a number of cell models and mouse models uh, of Huntington's disease. There are a number of different approaches to making these molecules and the number of ways of getting them into the brain of the animal. But basically, every time the, these Huntington lowering approaches have been tried, they have worked in that animal. Um, th there's a trial of this going on right now in motor neuron disease, also known as ALS, um, in humans. And in the past 12 months, and this was discussed at this meeting, we now have, have three different trials done in monkeys, which have large brains, quite similar to human brains, um, showing that the drug uh, can be, you can get the drug into the brain where it's needed, and where the drug lands, the gene is switched off. And those monkeys did not, on, on the whole, experience bad side effects from this. This is really happening, guys. So um, in the next 12 to 18 months, there'll be at least one trial of gene silencing, the very first in Huntington's disease, in human patients. 
Those trials, the first trials will probably happen in America, and they'll probably involve patients with early to moderate Huntington's disease. But very rapidly, I would expect there to be trials happening in Europe as well. Um, we've written about this a lot on HD Buzz, and these are three articles that you might want to look at. So all you do is type hdbuzz.net slash, and then either 69 or 58 or 23. Um, and once you're in one gene silencing article, you can easily click through to others. A lot of people, whenever I speak about gene silencing or Huntington lowering, they want to know how it works and how it will actually be in practice. Yeah. And right now, the way the way it works is that these, these are drugs that are made of DNA and made of RNA. And if you take them as a pill, they just get destroyed by the acid in the stomach. They don't get to the brain. So right now, these are treatments that all have to be injected into the nervous system, either into the spinal fluid at the base of the spine, or by directly being pumped into the brain or the ventricles that uh, are in the middle of the brain. So, you know, every silver lining has a cloud. The, uh, it, these are extremely promising drugs, but they, as they are envisaged now, they will involve at least injections into the spine and possibly injections into the brain. But if it works, it will be worth it. And then there's the question of whether we should turn off one gene or both copies of the gene. So everyone has two copies, and most people with Huntington's have one normal and one abnormal copy. If we could turn off the, the one that's making the mutant protein while leaving the other one nor, uh, still producing the healthy protein, that might be better. And that's something that's being worked on as well. Bev Davidson was the person who presented this Huntington lowering research, and uh, yesterday evening we interviewed her for Eurobuzz. So day two of our Eurobuzz video contains a really nice interview with Bev, um, who's one of the leading lights in the field of Huntington lowering, and very funny woman as well, which is always important. So a brief word about what we call post-translational modification. It's, it's total jargon. What it basically means is that once a protein is made in cells, that protein might need to go to different bits of the cell. And it's a bit like delivering a parcel. You stick a label on it, like a barcode or an address label on it. And that's what cells do, basically. And one of those little tags or labels that's attached to cells is called acetyl. It doesn't matter what it is or what it's called. But basically, there's a tag that uh, tells the cell to move the protein into this bag of enzymes which dissolve the protein and get rid of it. And that is how the cell gets rid of big proteins, like the Huntington protein. The, um, there's an enzyme called sirtuin-1. And one of the things that that enzyme does is it gets rid of these acetyl tags. So, if you follow me, what that enzyme does is it tells the cells not to get rid of the protein. So we want to encourage them to get rid of the bad protein, right? So what we want to do is decrease the activity of that enzyme. There's a lot of going backwards and forwards here. Bottom line is that if you can, if you can come up with a drug that inhibits this sirtuin-1 enzyme, you should be able to tag these proteins and tell the cell to get rid of them. And Siena Biotech, um, Andrea Caricasol is the guy who presented yesterday about this drug, this has developed an inhibitor of this drug called Silicistat. It's difficult to say with a dry man. <laughs> Silicistat. And this enzyme, when he looks at it in the lab and in the mouse models of Huntington's, encourages the tagging of that protein with that acetyl tag, which encourages the removal of the protein. And this drug has had a number of beneficial effects. We don't know whether it will work in humans, but this is a trial that's going on right now. It's called the Paddington uh, study, in part. It's supported by the EU and by the EuroHD network. Um, the Phase 1b trial completed. Phase 2a just finished last week in Europe. And so far, the drug appears to be safe. So um, the, the results of that trial have yet to be analyzed. And the next step, if, it, if they look good, would be to move to a larger trial to see if it can actually slow the disease. A brief word on synapses, because I want to move on now to something that's really cool, called phosphodiesterase inhibition. So as you probably know, signals in the brain are electrical. Our brain cells transmit signals electrically. But at the end of the brain cell, there's a gap. You can see it here. The gap between the two brain cells, and that's called the synapse. 
and the electrical signal reaches the end, but the signal gets across the synapse in chemical form. So what that means is that in the second cell, it receives a chemical message, and then it has to convert that to an electrical message for the transmission to take place. So this is the chemical outside of the second neuron, and this is the neuron. Basically, the chemical enters, and then a cascade of signaling happens. So one little thing triggers a big cascade. And then in the process of cleaning up that message, these enzymes called phosphodiesterase, or PDE enzymes, come into play. And they basically sweep up all of these signaling molecules. Now, in Huntington's disease, what's been observed is that the synapses, the connections between the brain cells, work less effectively. One of the reasons may be that these PDE enzymes are overactive, or they're they're cleaning up all of these signaling molecules too early or too much, which makes the signaling less efficient. So, one of the aims, and this has come about quite recently, just in the past two or three years, there's been a lot of excitement about whether we could inhibit these PDE enzymes with a drug, and whether that might improve the functioning of synapses. And this is where the drug giants come in, Pfizer and Glaxo, GSK. Um, Pfizer has a drug with this extremely catchy name that inhibits a, a PDE called PDE10 and restores uh, some of the synaptic problems in HD um, and improves damage to cells in HD mice. And they're working closely with CHDI to test these cells. And I have to say that the results that were presented look really encouraging. This is a drug that really does seem to be making a difference to the functioning of synapses. And if we're lucky, it may have more long-standing effects as well. And Pfizer has, you know, Pfizer's a, in a real drug professional. It has an extremely sensible plan for first looking at patients to see whether we find the same signaling problems, and then moving forward into a human trial. And that, this is all happening now, and it's likely to be happening. The, the trials will, uh, and the human studies will be happening next year with good luck. And then GSK also has a PDE program. The one they've chosen to focus on is PDE4, and that's the name of their drug. You can't buy it online, unfortunately, but uh, even if you can remember the name. Um, and their drug has also shown it, uh, promising signaling um, improvements when they test it in cells in a dish. And the, uh, in particular, they've noticed that the, uh, some of the electrical clues that, that, that tell us whether the cells will be good at learning new things seem to be improved in the presence of their drug. They've tested it now in healthy volunteers. There are some concerns about side effects like nausea in, in, in uh, healthy volunteers, but they nonetheless plan to move forward soon into a human trial to see whether overall this helps or makes things worse. And we'd be optimistic that it will help. We've, because of the excitement, we wrote a, a Buzz article about PDE inhibitors, which is uh, buzz.net slash 86. Okay, we're, we're getting there. Oh, and this is my impression of Pfizer and Glaxo. Um, they are, we know, we're now at a stage where we basically have these two elite athletes racing towards trying to produce drugs for Huntington's disease. So it's a pretty healthy situation to be in. Um, this was intriguing to me. This is the last drug that I'm going to talk about, bupropion. Um, so this was something new that I learned at this uh, meeting. Bupropion is also sold as Wellbutrin. It's a drug to help stop people smoking. But apathy is what it's being aimed at in Huntington's disease. Apathy is when patients with Huntington's disease have trouble motivating themselves to get out of bed or to go to work or to uh, go out and socialise. Sound familiar? Yeah. I hear about it a lot and, and you know, it's, it's something that we really struggle to treat. So it'd be great if this works. The study's called Action HD, and it's happening in Germany. It's enrolling now. So that was pretty exciting news, and we look forward to hearing uh, what the outcome of that is. Okay, so the final thing, assuming I still have some minutes, two, okay. <laughs> the final thing then is stem cells. Um, big headline grabbing thing with stem cells. A stem cell is a cell that can turn into any other cell type. So they, they sound amazing, and they are. We all began as stem cells. Um, what stem cells are not is a magic treatment of Huntington's disease. So you can't just take stem cells, turn them into brain cells, inject them into brains, and assume that 
brain cell that died will be replaced. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. It's a bit like you know, running lightning into a, into a dead body and expecting it to wake up. Um, it, it, it would be nice, but it's, it's not what happens. Um, what they are right now, though, stem cells, is an extremely useful tool for studying Huntington's disease. In particular, these, these fellas called IPS cells, which stands for induced pluripotent stem cells. Basically, you take a skin sample from a patient with HD or with a mutation, and from it, you turn the cells backwards into stem cells, and then you can turn them forward into neurons. Now, until now, the only way we could get neurons, living neurons, that were human, uh, was either by buying them from a shop, for an online store, in which case they're nothing to do with Huntington's disease and nothing to do with real patients, or um, to uh, use animal neurons. So you can take an HD animal and extract the brain cells from it. But what you can't do is, is stick your hand into patients' brains and take out the brain cells and look at them under the microscope <laughs> and test drugs on them. What IPS cells are enabling us to do now for the first time ever is to, to have actual cells that contain the real DNA of real patients uh, but behave and look exactly like neurons. And so we can test drugs on them and we can look at them in incredible detail and, and say how, what's going wrong in these neurons. This really is an incredible uh, advance. Uh, and believe it or not, this year and last year is the first time it's been possible, and it's thanks to a, a big multinational stem cell consortium, which involves people from all over the world. Um, and so um, Lisa Ellaby was the person who, uh, uh, who spoke to us about that, as well as Leslie Thompson um, from California. So Lisa was at great pains to point out that this is not a treatment yet. It may be, but we're talking at least a decade, probably more. Uh, but what they are right now, definitely, 100%, is a really valuable research tool for studying Huntington's and testing these drugs. And because it's exciting, uh, oh, this is Lisa Ellaby, by the way, who confessed that, as well as pool, she was a big fan of wearing tutus. Um, on day two of our Eurobuzz, we interviewed Lisa as well. So do take a look at that video, because Lisa's really good at explaining um, what stem cells are, what she did, and how these will be useful research tools. I believe that that is all I have to say. Thank you for giving me some extra minutes, and thank you for your attention.